Hello, welcome back to a new class on Reaching New Levels of Faith. My name is Curtis Hartshorn. We are at the 15th class, How Does Satan Attack Our Faith? We've been through the five levels of faith and now you understand how to identify where you're at in your faith and how to move forward, how to reach that new level of faith. And last class we talked about how to reach mature faith. But there's a couple of other topics before we close out this series. And one is I want to talk to you in a very practical way about how does Satan attack our faith. First thing I want to establish with you is that Satan is the ruler of this world. And I'm going to give you many scriptures on this. And on all these scriptures, I've altered them. I've put in bold the parts I want to call your attention to. So emphasis mine on all of these. But let's start with the one in John chapter 12, verse 31. It says, Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Talking about Satan. In chapter 14, verse 31 says, I will not speak much more with you, for the ruler of the world is coming, and he has nothing in regard to me. And then in chapter 16, verse 11, and regarding judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Then over in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verse 53 says, While I was with you daily in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this hour and the power of darkness are yours. Going to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says, In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, in which you previously walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. In the same book, chapter 6, verse 12, says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the ruler, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. We'll come back to that scripture here in a moment. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13, For He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. 1 John 4 verse 4 says, You are from God, little children, and have overcome them because Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Chapter 5, verse 19 says, We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Then looking at the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 9 says, And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And then Revelation 20, verses 7 and 8 says, When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations. And I don't have the time right here to teach you about Revelation, but if you don't know, that passage has already been fulfilled. Satan is released on this earth. He truly is the ruler of this world. He is the God of this age. And this Satan has a scheme. He has a plan for you. First thing I want you to understand is that Satan is not stupid. You need to understand this. I know when I played college sports, when I played basketball, we'd always get the scattering report. And the scattering report told us, what the other team was good at, what their strengths were, uh, how smart they were, how tall they were, how fast they were, what, what offense, defense they ran. And then that whole week we would train to be able to play that team. Well, you got to understand Satan and you got to know he's not stupid. He has a plan. He knows exactly what he's doing. In fact, Ephesians chapter 6 We'll read verse 10 to get the context of that verse that we just mentioned a, a little bit ago. Verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, and against the spiritual forces of wickedness, in the heavenly places. 
We're told that we need to put on the full armor of God so that we can stand against the devil's schemes. You know what a scheme is? A scheme is a plan. He has a plan. Think about a, a military plan, a strategy. He has a way he is trying to get to you to ruin your faith. And I want to talk to you about Satan and his plan. And I'm not talking about Satan from long, long ago. I'm going to talk to you about the Satan who is working on you this week, who brought up an old temptation, perhaps in a sin, that you thought that you were pretty well under control, and he threw that up in your face this week. Or the Satan who's trying to convince you to go to that sporting event or that, that other activity instead of being at church this Sunday. That's the Satan I want to talk to you about. He has a plan, and he is trying to weaken your faith. Let's talk specifically about how Satan does that. What is Satan's goal? Well, if Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen, or I really like the, the New International Version 1984, says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And again, I put the emphasis there on sure and certain because I want you to see those. If that's what faith is, then what is Satan's mission? Well, this is Satan's mission statement, and this is in your workbook. Satan is trying to make you unsure and uncertain of your faith. If, if faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we don't see, then Satan's goal is to make you unsure and uncertain of your faith. He does not have to destroy your faith to win. He just wants to get you to compromise. He works through media, school, music, friends, and even family to plant seeds of doubt in your mind. Satan's goal is for you to have stagnant faith. No growth, no reaching out. It pleases him to see nominal church attendance. He's fine with that. He just wants to compromise you. He just wants to weaken your faith, make you a little bit unsure about this, a little doubt here, a little doubt there, and he can bring your faith down. We need to be aware of his schemes. How does Satan do this? Well, let's talk about several ways that Satan attacks our faith. So number one in your notes is he attacks our faith by providing temptation. He even tried to tempt Christ in Matthew chapter 4. Let's read the account together. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Satan, the devil, came and tried to tempt Jesus. Even though Jesus was sinless, he believed he could trip Jesus up, and he gave it his best shot. He first said, why don't you turn these stones into dread? Bread, you've been fasting for 40 days. You're obviously hungry. You have the ability to take that rock over there. You could turn that into bread and you could eat it. Jesus responds with scripture. 
He actually quotes the scripture when he says, man shall not live by bread alone. That's Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. But then Satan quotes scripture. In verses 6, verse 6 he says, he will command his angels concerning you. That's Psalms chapter 80, or 91 and verse 11. And then also verse 12. Here, Satan is using scripture. You think Satan doesn't know the Bible? Oh, he knows it very well. He knows how to twist it, how to manipulate it. But Jesus combats that with more scripture. He says, yeah, the Bible does say that. But the Bible also says in Deuteronomy 6 verse 16, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Each time he's trying to tempt him with something, he provides the temptation. That's what Satan does. He doesn't make you sin. Satan can't make you sin. But he can provide that temptation. And that's what he always is trying to do. In verse 11, when it says the devil left him, I really love the parallel account in Luke chapter 4, verse 13, where it says he left him for a more opportune time. Satan doesn't give up. He keeps coming and coming with a different scheme, a different plan. He's always trying to weaken us. He's always trying to get us to sin. You know, in the same book in chapter 5, Jesus is talking about a particular temptation in verse 27 that we face. It says, You have heard that it was said you should not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye makes you to stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Jesus is saying you're going to be tempted. And certainly lust is a temptation for all. I just finished reading a fascinating book about internet pornography and how the, the porn, has, porn industry has just taken over the internet and how many people are succumbing to that temptation. It's so easy. It's so, so accessible for people to get. And yet it's lust. It's sinful. And it's a trap of Satan. Anytime we sin, that spells victory for Satan. And he says, whenever you are tripped by the sin, you need to cut it off. We don't literally rip our eye out or cut off our hand, but he's saying you need to cut off a situation that's causing you to sin. You need to realize this temptation is before me because Satan is trying to make me stumble. He's trying to pull me away from God by providing temptation. But that's not the only way that Satan attacks our faith. He also attacks our faith, number two, by providing hardship. This is what he did to Job. When Satan and God were talking and God says, Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. And Satan's response is, Well, that's because you have protected him. You have provided for him. If you took those things away from him, he would curse you to your face. And that's exactly what the devil did. He took away his crops. He took away his herds. He took away his children. He took away his vocation. He took away his health. All these hardships God provided, or excuse me, Satan provided in a way to trip up Job. He does the same with us today. If Satan thinks he can cause you to turn away from God by providing hardship, that's exactly what he's going to do. He'll make sure you have hardship in your life. If he believes that if you lost this loved one or if you lost that job or whatever it is that you would turn away from God, then that's what Satan's going to do. He's going to provide hardship in your life. But another very sneaky way that Satan trips us up, number three, is by providing affluence. Sometimes he takes things away. Sometimes he gives us things. Affluence is a way that he trips us up. In the book of Proverbs, there's an interesting passage I want to share with you. It's, uh, you know, the Proverbs were written by Solomon for the most part, but not all of it. At the very end, in chapter 30 of Proverbs, there is another writer. 
He's Agur, the son of Jacob. It mentions him in verse 1. But I want you to, to drop down and see what this man Agur, what he says in verse 7 of chapter 30. He says, two things I asked of you. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I not be full and deny you and say who is the Lord, or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. Now listen to the wisdom of that. Here Agur is saying, I don't want to be poor because I might steal and I'll dishonor you. I don't want to be affluent either. I don't want to have too much because then I might get to the point where I feel like I don't need you anymore, God. Affluence is one of the tricks of Satan. It's a way that he could trip you up. Sometimes we get that, that job promotion. We say, well, boy, God's really blessed me. It may not be God at all. If that job is going to pull you away from a strong church and take you someplace where you're not going to grow as much in your faith, if he can somehow convince you you need to spend more time at that job and not enough time studying the Word of God and praying and, and attending services. Sometimes when we get wealth, and we live in a very wealthy country, by the way, and we're all wealthy compared to the rest of the world, we may not realize it, we're not as likely to serve God. We are more inclined to seek God when we're hungry. And so if Satan can trip you up by providing affluence, that's what he'll do. Another thing that Satan will do is he will provide propaganda which discredits the Bible. There's lots of lies that Satan likes to put out there that sometimes we hear these and it, it harms our faith. Let me share a couple with you. These are in your notes. One is that the Bible is contaminated. In other words, the Bible, you can't really trust it. It's not from God. There's books that were added. There are books that were left out. And so we really can't know for sure that we have the true Word of God. That's a lie of Satan. The Bible is the inspired Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. No book got left out. No book got added in that God didn't want in. No word, not even the smallest letter, the, the least stroke of the pen has been altered in the Word of God. It truly is His Word. Here's another lie of Satan. The earth was not created by God. There's natural explanations. There really is no God that the world just poof, just came into existence. If you want to to hear more about that, we just recorded a class on BibleTalk.tv, The Literal Genesis by Kim Wall. I'd recommend that you look that up and watch that. That will answer a lot of those questions and show you, expose that lie of Satan. The earth truly was created by God. Here's another one. Marriage doesn't have to be for a lifetime. Things get a little rough, you know, just get a divorce, it's okay. That's a lie of Satan. God wants us to work on our marriages. He wants us to hang in there, to learn how to get along with each other, to learn how to follow the, the guidelines of what makes a godly and a beautiful marriage. Along with that, this is another lie of Satan. No one is to be the head of the household. That's an old antiquated idea, and there really is no, no head of the household anymore. No, it's not just an antiquated idea. When you truly understand how leadership and submission works in the home and in the church, it's actually a very beautiful thing. And we have to understand what godly leadership looks like, and we have to understand what godly submission truly is. But that is a lie of Satan, that, that that's not necessary. That is a very important part of the family and in the church. Here's another lie of Satan. Homosexuality is an acceptable alternative lifestyle. No, that's not true. Homosexuality is a sin and sinners need to repent. We also have a, a book that's available if you want to contact or a PDF of Gay Rights or Wrongs that Mike Mazzalongo has edited. Excellent material just helping you understand homosexuality and what the Bible actually says about that. And along with that one, this is a recent 
thing that Satan is trying. Marriage is for any two people who want to marry. We're redefining what marriage is, which we really don't have the right to do because we didn't invent marriage. God invented marriage. He decides what it is. And God has decided that it is a man and a woman who are joined together, and that's what constitutes a marriage. Another lie. You don't have to accept your God-given gender. This has caused so much confusion in our world. And there's, there's so many tragic stories that I've heard recently about people's lives who have been messed up because they were confused about their gender. They perhaps even went ahead and had some altering surgery or, or different kinds of, of uh, drugs and things that they were taking that are messing them up. Don't listen to that lie of Satan. One more here. The destiny of the world is in human hands. This is the idea that the world's just going to go on and whatever happens is just what we make happen and, and it's all in our hands. I'm so glad that this is not true, that the destiny of the world is in the hands of God and God alone will decide when everything is over. Be keen to the lies of Satan and the propaganda that he puts out to try to discourage us and try to pull us away from the truths of God. Let me talk to you about a fifth way that Satan attacks our faith. Satan attacks our faith by convincing us that we are worshiping God when we're actually not. In the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, God says this through the inspire, inspiration of the prophet Malachi, chapter 1 and verse 6. A son honors his father and a servant is master. Then if I am a father, where is the honor? And if I'm a master, where is my respect? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest, who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? You're presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? In that you say the table of the Lord is to be despised. But when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you present the lame and sick, is it not evil? Why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased with you? Or would he receive you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? But now, will you entreat God's favor, that he be gracious to us? With such an offering on your part, Will he receive any of you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the gates, that you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. I'm not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept any offering from you. Now, this is Old Testament. We, we live under the New Covenant and we, we worship, but... But here's an idea of, of how God feels about half-hearted worship or, or making these uh, sacrifices of blind animals. He says, I wish somebody would just shut the temple doors. That's not worship. Worship is to be an expression of love towards God. Proskuneo, the Greek word, means actually to kiss toward God. I, I'm showing God how much I love you. Just being at a worship service doesn't mean you're worshiping God. Worshiping is something you as an individual intentionally do. And being surrounded by people worshiping doesn't mean that you're worshiping. In Revelation chapter 3, the, as Jesus is writing to the seven churches of Asia Minor, the last, the seventh church is Laodicea. In chapter 3, verses 14 through 22, he rebukes them pretty strongly for their lukewarmness. He says, you think you're... You're rich and that you have everything, but you don't realize you're wretched and pitiful and poor, blind and naked. And he says, I'm outside the door knocking. In verse 20, he says, I stand at the door and knock. If you open up, I'll come back in and enter with you. What's interesting about that is they were still attending church. And yet they were in apostasy. Christ was outside of their lives. Just because you're going to church doesn't mean that you are worshiping God. You know, you can sit in a worship service without ever worshiping God. And you can also sit at home watch a worship service 
And that's not a one-to-one -one substitute for assembling with believers. This is another thing that has really been a struggle for people is with the COVID and, and the pandemic, there's been a lot of people just staying at home and not worshiping, not assembling with the Christians. You know the word church, ekklesia in the Greek, means to assemble. It was kind of a military term. It meant to rally the troops, bring the army together so we can go to battle. That's what we do when we are assembled. We come together. And when we're off just worshiping in our homes, we're really not together. We're not praying together. We're not taking the supper together. You know, the Lord's Supper is about more than just my relationship with God. It's about my relationship with you, with my brothers and sisters. I can't really take the supper together if we're separated in our homes. How can we speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. We're not really singing together if we're not together. How can we encourage one another? Now understand that there are instances where we're, we're actually shut in, where we're not physically capable of making it. We've always had shut-ins long before the pandemic. But if you can be at church and you're not going, ask yourself, why are you not going? And I want to be really clear about this. You're not going to stand before me on Judgment Day. I'm, I'm not here to judge you and I'm not here to say anything to hurt you. I'm, I'm saying this because I love you. Let me encourage you to do what I do. Anytime I have something come up and it looks like I might miss church for one reason or another, I always ask God. You know, God, here's the situation, and, and I think I'm going to have to miss church because of this or that. Maybe it's the weather, or maybe it's a, uh, an illness, or any number of things that might come up. I, I picture myself standing before God and explaining to God. And if God would say to me, I understand. You're making the right choice. The weather's too bad or, or you're too badly hurt or you're too badly sick to be at church. I understand. If God says that to me, my conscience is at ease. But if God says, you know, Curtis, if you really wanted to, you could be there. I understand this would be a little tough and that'll be tough, but you could be there. Maybe it's work. You know, a lot of times we, we miss church because of work and and sometimes it's pretty tough, you know, if the boss is saying, I've got to have this report done or we've got to get this done before this happens. But if you could have changed things earlier on so that you wouldn't be in that tight spot on Sunday and miss church or Wednesday night and miss Bible class or whenever it is, if God is saying to you, you know, if you put a little more effort into it, you could be there, then go. Find a way to be there. God wants you to be assembled. He wants you to receive the strength and the encouragement of being with the church body so that your faith can grow. And step back and look at the spiritual battle that's taking place here. Satan is trying to derail your faith. If he can get you to stop going to church, this is a great victory for him. Or if he can get you to attend church, but you're really not worshiping God, you're not participating, that's a great victory for him. Satan is crafty. He has lots of different ways that he tries to derail our faith. I'm asking you to think carefully about what's going on in your life. How is Satan trying to get to you and then decide he's not going to have a victory in this area of my life? I'm going to be victorious over him. It's hard to believe we're at the very last class. Our next and final class, class number 16, is Do I Trust God? You know, in the end, that's what all of this boils down to. When we're talking about faith, do I really trust God? Look forward to seeing you in the next class.